Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Hallelujah. Now, today I'm going to talk about a very interesting topic again that leads us to the mind of Christmas. The birth of our beloved Lord and Savior. The Bible calls him the indescribable gift. Hallelujah. The Bible calls Jesus the indescribable gift. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, the Bible says. That means if we start to describe what we would be like without Jesus, if we for a moment talk just minutes to ponder what it would be like if you did not have Christ, you understand? If you did not have your present help in time of need, if you did not have the friend that sticks closer than a brother, if you did not have the rock of ages, the lion of Judah, that great, if you did not have Jesus on your side. I don't know whether for a moment many of you have thought what it would be like, what a world would be like if we did not have God, if we did not have Christ in the flesh. What life would we be having? You understand? Praise God that Jesus Christ came. Praise God that Jesus Christ came. Somebody shout hallelujah. So we thank God for Jesus. The Bible calls him the indescribable. You know, sometimes we go through things, and some of us, every one of us, if you look at yourself individually, you have your story. You understand? You have your skeletons or your flesh in the closet, whatever you want to call it, or your clothes or shoes in the closet. You have... You know, your story of sickness, your story of trial, your story of tumult, your story of pain, your story of disappointment, your story where you go to the end of your life. I know someone here who came to the meeting with poison. They were supposed to poison themselves, and they just came to a meeting, and they heard the gospel, and they threw out the poison. And so you ask yourself, where would you have been without this indescribable, inexpressible, free gift, Christ? Hallelujah. But many times I've seen um, that, well, many accounts have been given that lead to the birth of Jesus. But there's a, something special, a special story I want to introduce you today, that for all my years actually in church, ever since I started hearing preachers preach, I have never heard preachers go this way, that I'm going to go this morning. I've never heard ministers go this way, or maybe some Maybe they have, but I, I was not where they were <laughs> when this was spoken. But it's not something that I had since I was a child. But you see, recently as the Spirit of the Lord was telling me about Christ as we're coming to this day, it's something that kept hitting my head so hard and kept, you know, literally, almost the whole chapter was given to that account in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew. And it is a place and thing that we know most, but has a very deep revelation of this man called Jesus. Matthew chapter 2. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2, the Bible says, from verse 1, When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of Jews, of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east and are come now to worship him. Where is he which is born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship. And for me, it fascinates me every time I get into the whole star issue, right? Because the book of Psalms says somewhere in scripture that the stars speak, okay? That's why the people of the world um, diverted it and then contaminated it with with human mysticism and carnal, uh, 
wickedness and, and drew the whole line of astrology, right? Astrologers, the readers of the stars. But in, in the end of it, trying to interpret the lives of people and events that follow them, depending on that star, if you're Virgo, if you're Leo, if you're Sagittarius, or, you know, unfortunately they know, there's no Zion there. But the, 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 before an old man comes into the mind of reading the stars, and misinterpreting them in line with human philosophies, humanisms, and all these kinds of things that are, you know, convoluted in our idea of things that were originally the mind of God but have gone in the wrong hands and minds and therefore have diverted the whole concept and made the whole idea ugly. Yet in actual sense, there's a revelation somewhere there. There's a reason why Jesus is represented as a star, right? This was ancient wisdom that when they see something in the sky, they know that truly something up there is happening. There is somebody out there born. So I told people, you must be represented somewhere up there. Right? He told Abraham that your descendants shall be as the stars. You understand? He calls Jesus as a star. He's defined as the star of David. You understand what I'm saying? So I believe that there is a godly and divine way of explaining the whole line of stars and what they represent for every individual in this room versus how the deceived of this world have made it, you know, appear. And therefore the church has automatically ejected the whole concept of stars. Then wise men would not come seeking for it. How would they look at it and know that this is a king of the Jews? They're not just saying that just, just a notable guy has been born, but it is clear it is saying the king of the Jews. That means there was something they, that they could tell that this, this was something different. And these were wise men. Okay? Now, the Bible says they came to King Herod, saying, where is the king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And the Bible says that when Herod the king had these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Right? He was troubled and all oh, Jerusalem with him. And I'll explain why he was troubled. In that time, I want you to first understand this. In that time, you are telling me that Herod is the king of Judea. Right? And they're telling him the king of the Jews is born. How can that not be a threat to the man already on the throne if he knows that his sons are still existing and he's not yet dead and they're telling him some greater, another idea of kingship has been born in the time when there's an existential one. I'll explain that later. Now the Bible says when Herod the king had these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem. And when he had gathered, you saw immediately when he hears that, he tells the wise men, wait for me a bit. He goes in the back end, he gathers all the chief priests, listen, priests, and scribes of the people together, and he demanded of them where Christ should be born, not could be born. Should be. That means something in his soul convinced him that this could be true and should be true. They knew what it means for a star to be born. And of course in that time and culture when a man appeared before the king, they had their reputation already when it was reputable that men from afar used to visit kingdoms, right? But when men came and they had a reputation that preceded them and you knew they were men of wisdom, they don't just move thousands of kilometers or miles away for nothing. So he knows this must be holding water enough. So he says, you know what? You scribes, you Pharisees, go back in the books and understand by the book where this Christ should be born. And, and the next verse says, and they said unto him, We've seen it in scripture, it is in Bethlehem of Judea, for that it is written by the prophet, uh -huh. and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people of Israel. And the next verse says, And then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. You understand, now he has believed that there is a guy born. So what star, what time did the star appear? And, the next verse, and then, then he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. The next verse says, And 
when they had departed the king, uh, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Praise God. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, fell down, worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Praise God. Now, when you go to verse, and, and then, of course, behold, the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream, tells him, take the child and his mother and flee into Egypt, for though the, I'll bring thee the word for Herod, will seek the child to destroy him. So not only does he come in a, in a dream to warn the wise men, he also goes to Joseph and tells him, get your wife out of here, because this guy seeks the life of that child. And when they arose, he, arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And they stayed there until Herod was dead. Praise God. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Again, you see, out of Egypt have I called my son. And then Herod, now they take us back to the story. Yes, they tell us he, they, they stayed there until Herod died. But let us go back to the story, right? And then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked by the wise men, he was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof from two years old. And under. This man realizes they have not come back to him, but he believes that the king is born. He doesn't suspect, he believes. So what does he do? He tells them, get all the children, two years and under, kill them. So they killed all of the children that time. Praise God. And the Bible is clear that verses 19 no, actually, verse 18 says, In Rama there was a voice heard lamenting and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. There's a deep thing there, why the scriptures use Rachel. Talk to me nicely, I'll share it one day, it's beautiful. But anyway, and, but when Herod was dead, because he had to die anyway, behold, an angel of the Lord appears in the dream to Joseph in Egypt and tells him, Take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young man's life. And then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. And when he had heard, Achelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod. He was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside in the parts of Galilee. And when he came and dwelt in the city of Nazareth, that it might again be fulfilled, which was spoken of the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Right? So now you're seeing the picture of, he shall be called a Nazarene. In Egypt shall I call a son, you see, so, and he's born in Judea, Jerusalem. Born in Judea, Jerusalem, called a son in Egypt, and called a Nazarene. So he takes on different forms and identities because of what and who was seeking after his life. So many things people become when the devil starts to pursue. You understand? But this son of God, at one point, is called a Nazarene. The same son of God, he is called in Egypt. Praise God. And all of this was prophesied. He's born in Bethlehem of the lowest of the princes in Judea. Yes, in Judea. You understand? So anyway... But there's some that intrigues me about this. One, that I don't know whether you have noticed that the same experience that happens to Moses is the same experience that happens to the Christ. Because when Moses was little, if you remember that time, children were killed. Satan was looking for something. You understand? Satan was looking for something. In Moses' time, it was a different idea and story, but same spirit. It gets onto the ruler and stirs in him the mind and intent to kill. We all know the power and grace that was on Moses. The Bible tells us he was the most humble man on earth. He received the law. You understand? It was not a small thing. 
But I will also come to that of why the Bible says Moses was very meek. Underline that Moses was very meek, right? And the Bible is very clear. Even though he was a lawgiver, he was not a man of the law. Even though he was the representation, he was the, 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 the picture of the law. He was the figure of the law, but he was not of the law. Right? Because the Bible says in Deuteronomy, the righteousness of faith speaks this wise. And then they quote Moses. Right? When he speaks of the law, he tells them this shall stand as a witness against you. He didn't say against us. He didn't get himself in the story as a man under the law, but yet he was a man that represented the law, that brought the law to us. So you see Moses as being part of the holistic picture of God, trying to reveal the holistic plan of God for mankind. That the law came, that all men should be called guilty and all judged under the law, and Christ comes for the end of the law, to the prophesiation, the justification of all that believe, and upon all that believe. Why? Because when Christ is the end of the law, he gives righteousness to every believer. Moses is telling us that righteousness is by works. But Moses knows, even though he's telling people that righteousness is of works, he knows no man shall be fulfilled or justified by the law, such that he leads us to Christ. So we see in Galatians that Moses was not an enemy to Christ. The Bible says, indeed, that the law was the schoolmaster that led us to Christ. So Moses is not an enemy to Christ. No. In fact, Paul says, the law is not bad, for by it I knew, I understood what was evil and bad. But it did not have the power to save me. It only showed how wicked man can be, such that it can put man in the most desperate states to have a need of a savior. Somebody said hallelujah. So it's almost as though like how Moses, God appears to Abraham and tells him, that, you know, in you shall all this be justified. I will justify the Gentiles by faith. And the scriptures first seeing that God would justify the Gentiles through faith, he preached this gospel afford to Abraham. It's the same thing with Moses. The Bible is very clear. He saw him who was invisible. He refused to be called the son of the daughter of Pharaoh. He esteemed Christ's greater riches rather than uh, have those little treasures of Egypt for a time. The Bible says he had respect unto the recompense. That means Moses saw Christ. And when he saw Christ, the Spirit of the Lord leads him to give men the law, right? Such that they can see how wicked a man can be to the end when they really know that they are wicked and, and there is nothing that can justify them. Christ comes into the picture and takes over as, as Moses is the end of the law, I mean, as Christ becomes the end of the law, and righteousness to whosoever believeth. So Moses and Jesus were tag team partners. Satan had to attack Moses because he could sense that there was a plan tagged to Moses that would bring forth the revelation and full picture of the Christ. That is why when Jesus meets them, he says, and he began to expound about the things concerning him, beginning from Moses. Jesus can clearly show his roots when he begins from Moses. Praise God. He says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expanded unto them all the scriptures of the things concerning himself. That means if you read Moses with the eye of the Spirit, you can see Christ all over. Somebody shout hallelujah. Some people get the misunderstanding that because Moses is the end of the law, Christ is the beginning of righteousness upon all who believe, and that if you are under Christ, you are not under the law, but under grace, and the law brings out all wickedness and sin, for without the law, sin is dead, but because of the law, the Bible says it routes in me all manner of concupiscousness, and so we start to think that the law is an enmity to the ministration and the person of Christ. No, the law is not the enmity to the person and ministration of Christ. No, the law is the schoolmaster. The law is the direction that leads us to the Christ. Where in now we're in the freedom of that Christ, where now we're not under the law but under grace, but we respect the law. Because he, Moses, led us to Christ. So we are not under the law. We don't preach the law. We don't advocate for men to be under the law, but because we don't do that, it doesn't mean that we don't have respect for Moses and the law. We have respect for Moses and the law. For indeed, even to the end of this communication, as the grace of God is in our lives, it teaches us to delight all ungodliness. It gives us the strength and power. Grace is a divine empowerment by God, again, for us to work out the law. 
but not as working out the law to please God, no, but as the law worked out as a result and aftermath of our full trust and adherence and faith toward God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Therefore, we cannot be grace preachers and therefore speak sin or promote sin or make it easy for you to sin because you're under grace. If you're that kind of person, you have not understood grace. Underline that. Praise God. Or even Christ and why he died. You cannot do easily what the man died for. We cannot do easily what the man died for. Praise God. None born of God commits deliberately, habitually. It's not in our spirits too. Even though your flesh is fighting, your spirit doesn't agree with it. But if you get to a point where your spirit has died to the consciousness of who Christ is and the wickedness of sin, then you need a savior. Praise God. Anyway, back to the story. But who was Herod? I want you to understand who exactly Herod was. In fact, Herod, the name means hero. Interestingly. Herod, the name means hero. Interestingly. So he's the typification of heroism in the world of fallen men. Okay? And I'll explain something there. Let me probably put it in context for you so you understand it. Rome has taken over the Jews. It has taken over Israel. It has literally conquered Israel. Israel is a colony of Rome. Right? Now there is a gentleman called Antipater. He was from Edomia. Originally a man who is Roman. They start distributing different areas of Israel to different individuals for governorship and kingship. It is easily understood to the Jew if we say this is your king. You understand? Because that's the only way you can rule. You can rule them by putting governors over them who in their picture, because in the Jewish culture, they don't understand governor. The Roman understands it, but the Jew doesn't understand governor. So if we put a governor over a Jew, chances are that the Jew will understand the concept and operation of this governor as a king. So, literally to the Jew, this is a king. You understand what I'm saying? So, of course, Rome was a big empire. It even crossed the Mediterranean. It even had parts of North Africa to its colony. Literally, later on, you read that history, you realize Rome literally had taken over almost a huge chunk of Europe. Rome was big. So it's ironic that now Rome is nowhere and men don't speak Latin. You understand? It's amazing. There's an interesting story there. How Rome, the whole empire, comes down. Literally. And many, many practices in present-day church are Roman. So I worry for the future of many churches. Anyway, so back to the story here. And I want you to see the context of where I'm coming from to get the picture of what I want to show you tonight. So during that time, the son of Antipater of Idumea, the Idumean, Herod, he is crowned by the emperor of Rome. He tells him you're in charge. Of course, there were a few wars in 40 BC. And in 237, after defeating many of his enemies, he gained prominence. And then he's officially called the king of Judea, of the Jews. Of course, if you're a reader of the Bible, you're going to see the name Herod come many times. But don't be mistaken. He's not the same Herod, right? It was simply the Herodian family that Rome had given favor to, and consequently some of their sons come in and their sons' sons. So if you hear Herod, also son named Antipas, that's the son of Herod, this Herod that I'm talking about. This Herod I'm talking about in Scripture is called Herod the Great. For reference reasons, they called him Herod the Great. So Herod the Great is the son of Herod Antipas. But again, the son also carries the name Herod. Right? Those are the guys that live in the days of John the Baptist. And then later in scripture you'll hear uh, Herod of, of Agrippa the first and then 
uh, another one called Herod Agrippa II. Those are grandsons and great-grandsons of Herod the Great. So when you hear Herod, uh, Herod Antipas, Herod Agrippa the First, Herod Agrippa the Second, Herod Agrippa the Second is the son of Herod Agrippa the First. Herod Agrippa the First is the grandson of Herod the Great. Herod Antipas is the son of Herod the Great. So you see, it was a lineage. Are you following me? So in different occasions, you realize that these Herod heroes are usually opposed to the mind of divine purpose and the will of God concerning us, and they are then defined as the heroes of. They're defined as the heroes of, of the world. Anyway, if you read the story of Herod, many people only end to the point where Jesus comes in the equation. You understand? But if you read before, the 37 years of his rule, he died about 4 BC, right? The 37 years of his rule. They will tell you up to today, Presently, archaeologists tell you, history tells you that this man, even though he was Roman, I think, he did well to the Jews, right? He rebuilt their temple. In fact, part of the remains of that temple is that western wall in Jerusalem. Part of the remains of Herod's buildings is that wall. He rebuilt the temple. They, it was probably regarded as one of the most holy and sacred places of the earth. That's why people still go and pay pilgrimage to this particular long wall. Some of you have seen people go before walls. You understand? You understand? Anyway, so, and I want you to follow what I'm saying. So he does them well. He rebuilds the temples. The economy is robust. The commerce is good. In fact, by history, the Jews loved Herod. You understand? And interestingly, if you read the stories, you will realize that before Rome comes over to take over Judea, huh, the ruling family in Judea was Hasmonean. They used to call them the Hasmonean dynasty. Right? And because Herod wanted so much to belong to the Jew, he wanted so much to connect to the Jew, so much to connect with the Jew. And you must understand that that's how interesting this is, that he goes to the house of that Jew and then he asks for a wife. The Hasmonean household. The woman was called Mariamne. Right? Mariamne, right? So he gets into a place where he woos her, he wins her heart, she becomes his wife. Again, remember Rome had imposed rulership. The Jews have known over time that the first idea of kingship was not a godly idea. He had his own idea, but they imposed their own idea. For example, Saul was not God's choice, but he was a provisional idea of providing for men. He was permanent will versus what? Permissible. He was a permissible will. God is saying, I don't agree with this, but because you want it so much, I can allow it because I love you. Right? And that's an interesting experience, too, for you to undergo. But originally, these were not people with a king. And if you realize, even as the Jews later start scattering, you realize that many of them don't, they don't like that whole idea of kingship. It's not with them. In fact, if you're a reader of African history, and then you see some of the descendants of Abraham and some of through Mesopotamia. You realize now historians tell you that some of those bloods crossed all over into, into Egypt. Because there's a group that crossed all over from the lineage of Abraham. There's also a group that crossed all over in the days of Canaan and Cush. The Hamites. Ham. Right? Nilo Hamites. You understand what I'm saying? Now, if you, for example, go in some, as you go to the, to the south, uh, as you slope down from Egypt and come down through Africa, some of the bloods of Jews come down all through, even some in Uganda. Even some, that's why you realize there were tribes, even in Africa, that never used to have kings over them. Did you know that? Did you know that some of the areas in the west of Uganda all through that crossed down, some of those areas never had kingships? 
some of the areas in Angole, like the Omugabe, they were simply given. They were given Omugabe. They were given. They were, these were not lineages that come from far experiences of kingship. The British used to put some of these people in play. Even now you see some areas in Angole have refused kingship. It's an interesting story. But back to the story. So, Harold marries Mariamne of the Hasmonean dynasty of the Jews. He wants to belong to the Jew. He wants to consolidate himself as a Jew. He wants to stand in the place as a Jew and thereby have his place of kingship in the whole equation. He builds buildings, he builds empires, he builds an army, he makes Judea very successful. He was insecure. Herod's insecurity, all history will tell you, all his life he was an insecure man. He was a man who was always curious about everything. In fact, later in scripture you realize when Mariamne started to despise him because he beheld the doctrines, because she thought this woman, the Hasmonean Jew, she thought that if she married Herod, for some random reason, kingship would return to them. I mean, she'll have a child of Herod, and somehow, if Herod is king, and then her child will automatically become king, and somehow, again, the Jew will still be ruler of Judea. You see how much? And also, uh, this guy, Herod, is also marrying her because he feels he needs to be integrated further, so he's not insecure in his position as king of the Jews, even though he's not Jew. But what they both front is a love affair. Reasons why people get married. Question mark. Praise God. But it happened in history. Long and short, whatever it was, he became insecure. The in-laws were not friends. And history is very clear. He later fell out so badly with the same family and killed that woman and all her five kids. Because it later became apparent that the Jew was going to rule through the child of Mariamne. He killed that woman and all her five children. Right? Because he realized the Jew can't rule Rome. The Roman thing was in there. The blood was in there. You get my point? So the man was killed his wife. He has killed his children. You understand? He has fought many wars. And then you, after all this insecurity, he's finally sure that he's strong enough, he's getting to his old age, he's becoming sickly, and then he hears news, there's another guy, he's born. How can he take that? How can he take that? How can he take that? He can't take that. He can't take that. Remember, the scribes are on his side. Really, just priests are on his side. He has won the heart of Israel. The Jews love him. He has done a lot for them. The priests can't be there to open scrolls for Herod if he hasn't won their heart. He was their definition of hero. But you see, it's how desperate a man can be for power and establishing his kingship. He marries the woman he does not love. He kills that woman and even his own son. From his own what? Growing, right? And he's doing all of that. He's doing all of that because he needs to consolidate himself in power. How desperate the spirit of this world is. What men can do and are willing to do for the sake of power, for the sake of position, for the sake of authority, for the sake of honor, for the sake of attention. For you understand what I'm saying? He can even be convinced that he loves her because she holds a certain position. She has, can even be convinced that she loves him because he has a certain position. He, 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 can, he, she can do anything. But what is the agenda within the heart? Power. All the insecurity of everything happening is because some people, the moment they cannot keep a certain power, they lose everything. They have to do everything in their own might to keep power. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So that's the same spirit that says, you know what? Get all the kids under two. I suspect if he's born, I don't know when they saw him, but if he's in that age range, age, get two years and kill everybody. 
I don't care who dies. I, and, and the Bible says there were screams and pain and low things in Rama as Rachel wept for her children. Imagine women with their own children hold, oh my goodness, it even shocks you to think about it. If you're a woman, you understand what I mean. You have your own child, two months, one month, you're old, and a man comes in and puts a blade through that child's heart. Because there's a man out there who wants power and is desperate to have it. And the Son of God comes differently. The Bible says, Behold your king, he comes lowly. He's not on a horse, he's on a donkey's young one. He's on, an, he's on a colt, he's on an ass, he's seated on a donkey. He does not come with an army, he does not come with javelin, he does not come with spear, he does not come with sword, he does not come with shield, he does not come putting on an armory. No, the Bible says he comes, he's just... He's having salvation. He's lowly. He's riding on an ass and upon a cause the fall of an ass. He's a humble man. Moses? Moses? He comes and tells them, Look, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was so, these men would have fought and killed you. The kingdom I'm bringing is not of this world. It's not after fighting for positions. It's not after fighting for places. It's not the insecurity of what you're losing and what you're not, you're not get, you're gaining. It's not the place of willing to do everything to get up there. It's not that. People are going at their workplaces and blackmailing others and slandering and gossiping them to get up. What you see ministers speaking evil about fellow ministers and gossiping and slandering and, and then speaking all kinds of foolish things against them. There's nasty tendencies, the predispositions of, of simple common decency. They don't even understand what it means to be Christian. They have walked out of the love of God. They are competing. They are fighting. They are angry. They are hating. They are not hating. And it's, it's like the same spirit that is killing the Christ. I want to tell you what we call the Antichrist. The Antichrist is anything that is against the mind and the spirit, the person and the ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Jesus did not come to build kingdoms of men. Jesus did not come to build authorities of men. He did not, he said, if any of you regards himself to be great, let him be the least in the kingdom. If you know you're the greatest, be the least. That's why he gets to the feet of his own disciples and washes them. And he says, look, Peter says, you can't wash my feet. Or my master says, ah, if I don't do this, you'll not belong to me. I'm not saying that men did not honor him. I saw women pouring oil on his feet. They are worshiping. You know, they know that he's the son of God. But he does not take it in his own heart. Instead, he seeks to humble himself and come in the form of a servant, in the likeness of a man. He knows they honor him. They respect him. But he's not building a kingdom of men. He's not building a hero of men. He's not simply trying to in improve you to a place where you're unapproachable. He's not trying to give you a personal jet so people cannot get to you. He's not trying to anoint you so 20 cars are in front of you and behind you. And, and oh my goodness, and people can't even come to you if they don't lay the carpet. You don't enter the church. The Son of God was born in a manger. He was born next to animals and, and this. And he did not complain about that lordliness because his kingdom is not coming to be exalted. His kingdom is coming to exalt men. The Bible says he came to bring many sons to glory. That is the Jesus we are celebrating today. That is why we celebrate Christmas. He's the captain of their salvation through his suffering. You understand? Some saying, yes, God has anointed us. And yes, the anointing works through us. Yes, healings work through us. Yes, breakthrough works through us. Yes, God is giving you money. He's giving you cars. He's giving you everything you could ever ask for. But even when all these things are coming to you, remember the Son of God. He does not exalt himself in what he has achieved. You're going to drive nice cars, but they should not define you. You're going to live in mansions of millions of dollars, but they should not define you. His robe was put on a table and men cut slots on it. But when he was putting it on, he didn't go everywhere exalting his robe upon him. Because the robe does not make the Christ. The Christ makes the robe. You understand what I'm saying? What am I trying to say? That God will give you the pleasantries of this world, the comfort, 
that you could have in this life, he will give you all the cradle and cake that you need. He will satisfy you with all good things. He will fill you with everything. He will provide all your needs according to his riches and glory of Christ Jesus. He will uphold you because he honors his own. But while he does, still have the same mind which was in Christ, who found it no robbery to be like unto God, but humbled himself as unto the purpose. Because the cross was the purpose. The cross was the assignment. The cross was the mandate. He's saying, regardless of how far you go in God, never forget what he called you to do. Don't become a hero of this world and gain it all and use your soul. Don't become a hero of men. Walk in humility. Walk in lowliness. Bearing in mind that the kingdom that he has brought on earth is not like the kingdom of the heroes of this world. Ministers, as the Lord continues to exalt us, I see so much that men are now becoming heroes of the world. They're becoming more politically correct. If they don't address them this way, they will not preach. If they don't put this here, they will not walk. If they don't have 20 bodyguards, they don't come out of the house. And I'm thinking, what is happening to the church? This is not the Son of God. This is not the Son of God. This is not the Son of God. You never saw Jesus. Walking out because he has to have a bodyguard. No, the Bible says in many times he was up the mountains crying alone with his God. The men that surrounded him, surrounded him because of what they wanted from him. But not necessarily the security they could give him. I'm not saying that I'm against basic security as our Lord demands. Yes, that's all right. But why do you go in exalting yourself beyond a certain way? How many people have become unapproachable because they have a few millions on, on their account? How many of you have become so you know, exalted in yourselves because you have wonderful jobs. You can't do certain things in church because you are, you have money, you can't clean the floor. Because you have money, you can't, you can't be seen preaching on the streets because of a little job that pays you four million shillings. You fear to lose your reputation over four million shillings. And the guy you're preaching about was born in a manger next to animals. You understand? Some of you, you speak so much enough English that you can't testify about God. You feel ashamed to hold the Bible. You feel so educated to, to, to pray. You, you come when you want. You pray when you don't. You, you, you love God, but you love Him in your own space. You understand? You treat the poor like they don't mean anything. You can't even come close to certain people. You can't hug the dirty. You can't, you can't shake the hands of them that are maimed because you, you feel that you are special. You, you're up here and they're down there and everybody else in this world is supposed to be your slave and servant and you their master of all and controller. That is not what brought Jesus. May Christmas remind you and I that the kingdom of Christ is not the kingdom of this world. And how the world defines hero is not how we define hero. The world defines hero by many accomplishments that are physically seen. But there are people in case and are heroes in the gospel. There are people who have counted all things but lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ and they've counted him but done, but they might know him. There are people who don't sleep for your sake. You understand? What about those children who were killed? How many children were killed because the man was looking for one life? No wonder Rome fell. How much blood was shed on Rome to kill innocent lives because they were seeking for one individual? And it took place in history and nothing was done to that man until the day he died at his 70th year. But you see, the beauty of that end is he died before the ministration of Christ was complete. And Christ completed his ministration. You will always outlive your persecutors. Always. But most importantly, when I saw these things and I saw the man Moses in the plan humble, the man Christ in the plan humble, the mandate of Christ, not the kingdom of this world, but the kingdom of God. And I saw how that we could not wage war with the men of this world because our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty in Christ for the pulling down of strongholds. and cast. They are not carnal. We don't fight with flesh and blood. We don't fight the way this world fights. You understand? May this day put a meditation fixed in your head, a mental note that will not rub out, 
that when you are talking about Jesus Christ, you're talking about another mind of service. You're talking about another understanding. You're talking about another interpretation. You're talking about another grace. You're talking about another kingdom. You're talking about another life. We are anointed, but we are humble, as poor, yet making many rich, as having all things, yet having nothing. Right? Is that it? Yet we make many rich. That means you have the ability to amass. But every time you amass, your brain tells you, make another rich as deceivers and yet true and we have accepted to be called all sorts of names we don't give a damn what they call us all we do is maintain that we are true because we have you to account god for that is why we stand on this altar every day let this mind be in you that when christ came he introduced another way to be a hero he introduced another way to serve he introduced another kingdom. Align yourself to his mind. In Jesus' mighty name. Oh, to teach us God. 
everything he did was a lesson to us even tonight we learned one and a lesson we've learned well in jesus name if you're sick in your body i want to pray for you i decree and i declare god sets you free he heals you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet in jesus name if you're here and you want to give your life to christ you want to receive him tonight as your lord and savior come 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 if you want to receive him as your lord and savior repeat this word after me say jesus i have heard your story and i want to be a part of your life i believe that you came you died you rose again for me and now today i receive you as my lord and savior i'm born again amen the message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.